and take it away, Loretta. Okay, thank you. So yes, as you can see, there is uh, the University of Uvascula in the figure or the physics department, which is on this side of the bridge. I don't know if you have been there, but this white thing here is normally a lake, but of course now it's a bit icy. So here is the outline of my talk. So first I'm going to give a kind of lengthy introduction to my topic. And then I'm going to talk about my dissertation research, what I did, did in my PhD thesis. And that was basically divided in two parts. From one hand, I was uh, probing uh, neutronized double beta decay by charge exchange reactions. And on the other hand, I was probing those by using the ordinary muon capture. And then I will talk about what I have done after my defense, which was in October uh, 2020. And uh, finally, I'm going to give some future directions what I'm going to do here uh, in Barcelona. And of course, I'm also kind of uh, introducing you to the Finnish winter, as you can see here. Though it looks surprisingly similar to Madrid, now in January, as you may have seen these figures. But anyway, uh, to go to the introduction. So the motivation for my work is basically uh, the coming from the standard model. So as you may know, the current knowledge of all known particles and, and interactions between them excluding the gravitation, uh, is based on the standard model of particle physics. And according to the standard model, neutrinos are extremely weak, weakly interacting massless fermions. And even though tons of those are coming from the sun all the time, and passing through our bodies and the earth without interacting we don't know too much about those. And according to the recent solar neutrino experiments, the neutrinos have a non-zero mass, which of course conflicts the standards model perception of the neutrinos, as it assumes that those are massless. So this means that the standard, standard model is not accurate at least for describing neutrinos. So having that in mind, we could ask what else is there beyond the standard model, like you can see here in the figure. So if the neutrinos are massless, what is the absolute mass scale of the neutrinos? Uh, this is described here in my lovely figure. And is neutrino a Dirac or a Majorana particle, meaning is it its own antiparticle or not? And how could we answer these questions by means of nuclear physics? That is the big question in my thesis. So the most practical way at the moment would be observing neutrino double beta decay. By that, we could answer actually all of the questions here on my slide. So first, to give some insight on uh, double beta decay, I'm going to present the two neutrino or the normal ordinary double beta decay. So you probably know uh, beta decay better, but two neutrino double beta decay is basically uh, two beta decays happening at the same time. So the two neutrons inside the nucleus are interchanged into protons and two electrons as well as two anti uh, neutrinos are emitted. And this process may happen when the normal beta decay is not energetic, energetically allowed. So in, for some nuclei, um, 
the WPTDK is energetically favorable, whereas the uh, single beta decay is not. And this process is totally allowed by the standard model. And this is at the moment measured in some a uh, bit more than in 10 isotopes. But the half lives are of the order of 10 to 20 years or longer, meaning that this is a really rare process and a slow process. And then the neutrinos double beta decay looks quite similar to the two neutrino double beta decay, but as the name kind of tells, there are no neutrinos emitted. So only two electrons are emitted when the two neutrons inside the nucleus are changed to protons. And this requires that the neutrino is a Majorana particle. So in here, the neutrino has to uh, act as its own antiparticle so that it, this process would be possible. And it also violates the lepton number conservation law by two, since the uh, lepton number of the final state differs from the lepton number of the initial state by two units. And this is again against the standard model. And what makes this interesting is that the inverse of the half-life of this process is um, proportional to the square of the effective mass of neutrinos. So if we would observe this process, we could uh, extract the effective mass of neutrinos from the half-life. But uh, the uh, studying neutrinos double beta decay is extremely challenging. So from the ex sorry from the experimental side, um, this figure or sketch shows the energy spectrum of the two emitted electrons from these uh, two different uh, double beta decay processes. Uh, so, in the two neutron double beta decay, since uh, together with the electrons, there are two neutrons emitted, neutrinos, sorry. So, the energy spectrum is a wide peak here, since the neutrinos are carrying, carrying away a bit of the, or actually most of the energy released in this process. But since in the neutrinos double beta decay, there are no neutrinos emitted, the energy spectrum is a sharp peak here at the Q value of the process. And okay, this is just a scratch. So the actually the neutrinos double beta decay peak here is exaggerated. So in reality, it's even smaller than this. And the observing this small peak here requires extremely precise measurements and careful excluding of the all the background effects and so on. And to make things even worse, uh, as I said, the I measured half life of half lives of the two neutron double bit decay are of the order of ten to uh, twenty years. Whereas, according to the current experiments, the half lives of uh, neutronized double beta decay would be uh, of the order of 10 to 25 or longer uh, if it would be measured one day. And this is not all, but this is also uh, really difficult to describe theoretically which can be seen in this figure that you may have seen uh, elsewhere. So in here uh, are shown the matrix elements computed with different uh, models, EDF, IBN, QRPA, nuclear cell model, IMS, RG, and a couple of cluster, for example. And as you may see, 
the models don't really agree and there is huge scattering between the values of the matrix elements. And this means that we need some uh, detours to study uh, the neutrinos double with the decay. And that is what I have done in my thesis. So I will move on to my dissertation research now after the introduction part. So in my uh, thesis, I probed the neutrinos double with the decay by uh, two measured uh, or measurable nuclear processes. On one hand, by charge exchange reactions, either beta plus or beta minus type. And those are sketched here in the figure, which kind of um, summarizes my thesis. So the charge exchange reactions are here uh, shown uh, in red. And the neutrons double beta decay is the blue one. And the dashed lines here mean the virtual transitions through the intermediate states of the uh, double beta decay triplet. So the neutrons double beta decay um, changes the uh, the atomic number of the nucleus by two, and it runs through the uh, intermediate nucleus, which is mean between the uh, mother and daughter nucleus. And by charge exchange reactions, we could probe the transitions. I mean, these virtual transitions by studying the uh, charge exchange reactions either to the mother or to the daughter nucleus of the double beta decay triplet. And these uh, reactions lead to the same, uh, same states of the intermediate nucleus of the double beta decay as acts the as, as the <laughs> acts as the intermediate nucleus in this double beta decay process. Okay, and uh, the charge exchange reactions look like this in an equation form. So the uh, small a and b here are some uh, light particles and the x, uh, capital X and Y are the initial and final nuclei. And normally these a and b are some uh, light particles like proton and neutron or helium and tritium or vice versa, depending on the type of the uh, charge exchange reaction. So on, on the other hand, I studied ordinary muon capture, which is shown here uh, in green. And the ordinary muon capture looks like this. So the negatively charged muon is captured by the nucleus and then a muon neutrino is emitted and the uh, atomic number of the nucleus is changed by one. So meaning that one proton inside the nucleus is changed to neutron. And by studying ordinary muon capture on the daughter nucleus, we could again study uh, the virtual transitions of the, uh, I mean the right hand virtual transitions included in the double with the decay process. So, and my research is based on a proton neutron quasi particle random phase approximation or PNQRPA, which is a lot easier to say. And this uh, model describes the nuclear excitations in odd odd nuclei as proton neutron quasi particle pairs. And this model relies on the nuclear mean field approximation, which changes the system of strongly interacting fermions in, inside the nucleus into non interacting particles in an external uh, potential uh, resulted from the uh, nucleus in the nucleus. So this makes the computations 
uh, a lot easier. And uh, PNQRPA allows the use of large single particle bases with reasonable computational effort, which means that we can use uh, no core bases and hence um, reach wide excitation energy regions in medium heavy and heavy nuclei. And the downside of PN core BA is that there are some adjustable parameters like GPH and TPP, which are the particle hole and particle 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 parameters, which I'm going to tell uh, more later. So especially I'm going to uh, talk a bit about the GPH parameter. And uh, yes, the the, the the mean field potential we have in our calculations is usually the wood saxon potential, which is described here for protons and neutrons. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about the charge exchange uh, reaction study that I did in my thesis. So the particle hole parameter that I mentioned earlier is actually the uh, particle hole renormalization factor, which scales the particle hole matrix elements, which looks like this. Uh, in the PNQRPA approach. And traditionally, this parameter has been adjusted to the uh, observed or semi empirical Kammerteller giant resonances, which then fixes the one plus contribution to the neutronized double beta decay uh, matrix element. But uh, as can be seen here in the figure, in many cases, the two minus contribution, which is this, uh, is actually larger than the one plus contribution, which is this uh, red one here. And the two minus contribution is coming from uh, spin dival excitations in the process. So that brings to, to our minds, what if we adjusted the GPH to the isovector spin dival giant resonances instead, which would fix the two minus contribution, which is in many cases larger than the one plus contribution. So for that, we search from some experimental data and actually there are there is recent data on three helium tritium charge exchange reactions performed at RTMP in Osaka. So here is an example of a figure of the, the, the experimental data. So this is for 76 germanium. And from this, this data, one can extract the locations of the isovector spin dival trans resonances for the two minus uh, multiples. And for example, for 76 germanium in the figure, the extracted location of the trans resonances is about 18 points. 9 MeV. So in our studies, at first we compute the isovector spin dial uh, strengths in the double beta decay triplets using our uh, PNQRBA approach. And then we adjusted the GPH to the observed locations of isovector spin dial science resonances that I showed on the last slide. And then we computed the neutrinous double beta decay matrix elements with these parameter values. 
So in this figure, I show two different spectra. The black one is computed with the uh, particle hole parameter that was adjusted to the gamma teller giant resonance. And the red one is the one computed with the GPH that was adjusted to the uh, spin dipole trans resonance, which is shown here in the figure uh, on blue. So, as you can see, there are no huge differences in these two spectra, but the red one uh, should be more located on the uh, trans resonance energy. Okay, and so that was the parameter adjusting process. And then we took these parameters, two different GPH parameters for each nuclei, and computed the neutralized double with the gay matrix elements with these. So uh, you can find the all the study. I don't have the Anyway, in my uh, thesis, but here I just show an example of the results. So here I uh, show two different models for adjusting the GPH. So the model one in this case is the one where, where we adjusted the GPH to the gamma teller trans resonances and use this value for to scale all the uh, particle hole parameters for all uh, multipolarities. And the other model here is that where we used the GPH for all other multipoles, uh, GPH, I mean, which was adjusted to the spin dipole change resonances for uh, all other multipoles, but for one plus, we used this old value, which was uh, adjusted to the Campbell teller change resonances. And we also compared our results with uh, the matrix elements, which were computed in smaller bases with the gamma teller uh, parameter value. So in here, uh, I show the results from this. So the model one, where we used the old uh, gamma teller value, uh, was 5.7 plus minus something. And these, uh, I forgot to mention, but these errors are coming from the experimental locations of the uh, giant resonances. So these don't contain like a, a model errors or something like that. Only the error that is coming from our parameter adjusting. And then when we use the new value, which was adjusted to the uh, spin double change resonances for all other, but for the one plus uh, multiples, we got uh, 5.39, uh, which is not really far away from the original value. But when we compared our value, which I'm sorry, I don't know why I have wrong number here, but anyway, with the it's an earlier study by Johan Hyvärinen and my supervisor, Jörg Suonen. We noticed that there is actually a large difference compared to the value which was computed in a smaller single particle basis. So this means that our parameter adjusting does not affect the matrix element so much, but on the other hand, the size of the single particle basis was more important. So to summarize this uh, first part, uh, to, so the two minus contribution to the neutrinous double with decay matrix elements was often larger than the one plus contribution. But adjusting the GPH parameter to the uh, spin double two minus uh, change resonance instead of the gamma teller change resonance 
did not affect the neutrons double with the decay matrix elements uh, drastically. But on the other hand, the size of the chosen single particle basis was more important. Okay, and then I will move on to the muon capture, which was the other part of my thesis. So muon capture might not be so familiar for you. I don't know. So I'm going to talk a bit about the process first. So as I mentioned before, uh, the reaction looks like this. So the negative muon, which is actually initially bound on the atomic orbits of the um, atom, uh, is captured by the nucleus. And this leads to emission of uh, muon neutrino and, and the atomic number reduction by one. Okay, so this is what I say here. And so this is also a weak interaction process. It's mediated by a W plus boson. And it, it, will, it involves large momentum transfer of the order of uh, 100 MeV due to the large mass of the captured muon, which is about 106 MeV. And this is really, uh, this makes muon capture really similar process to actually neutronized double beta decay, where the momentum transfer is of the same order. And this is also a weak interaction process. And furthermore, the large mass of the muon also allows transitions to all uh, JP. I mean, to all multiple states up to high excitation energies, <clears throat> which means that by studying muon capture, we can access the intermediate states of neutralized double beta decay. And in this uh, process, both the axial vector coupling uh, GA and the pseudo scalar coupling GP are involved. And these uh, parameter values are not so well known, or at least the effective values of these parameters uh, are pretty deposited. So this is, and uh, this makes muon capture an interesting process. Is we could uh, probe the GA and GP on the momentum exchange region, uh, which is relevant for neutronized double beta decay. So all these things here on the slide make uh, muon capture a particularly promising probe for neutronized double beta decay. So at first we studied muon capture on 100 molybden, which uh, are actually to the ground state of uh, 100 molybden, which leads then to the excited states of 100 niobium. And the ordinary muon capture strength distribution in uh, 100 niobium was studied uh, at the music beam channel at RCMP in Osaka again for the first time. And here I show a spectrum for from uh, that experiment. So the energy here on the uh, x-axis is the excitation energy uh, in 100 niobium. And uh, yeah, the y-axis is the uh, muon capture strength. Okay, and then we computed the same spectrum uh, in 100 niobium based on the Morita Fuji uh, formalism, uh, which was first presented in this paper from 60s. And here we used also, as I mentioned, uh, these studies uh, based on PNQRPA2. 
And the in the BNQRPA, we adjusted the GPH to the gamma-modular change resonance, as we noticed in our earlier study, that uh, adjusting the GPH to the uh, spin diable change resonances did not affect the results too much. And then we compared the obtained spectrum with the observed one that was measured at RCMP. And in this figure, I show the uh, theoretical spectrum uh, on black. So the dashed line contains uh, only the zero plus, one plus minus, and two plus minus multiples, which are amongst the most important uh, in the muon capture process. And the solid line contains all the multiples that we can reach by our PNQRPA uh, no gore uh, approach. And the red one is the experimental spectrum. And all these spectra are actually uh, folded by a Laurentian folding. And as you may see, the agreement is pretty good. And there is uh, a giant resonance in all the spectra at around 12 MeV and tails on both sides of the giant resonance. So this is good news for us. So our model is capable of uh, explaining the giant resonance in the, at least in the case of uh, 100 myobium. Uh, hi, however, when we computed the total ordinary muon capture rate, that was too fast compared to the uh, Primakov estimates, which is not the measured one, but of course, um, it estimates the total capture rate. And to produce the Primakov estimate, we would need a strongly quenched uh, value for the axial vector coupling constant, GA. Okay, and then when we saw that our model is capable of describing uh, muon capture in uh, 100 niobium, we extended our studies to the daughter nuclei of double beta decay triplets, as I said, by studying the uh, muon capture on double with uh, the, the daughter nuclei of double with the decay. We could study the intermediate states of neutralized double with the decay. So we compared the ordinary muon capture matrix elements with the uh, neutralized double beta decay matrix elements computed in the same single particle basis and the same parameters. And yes, these are shown, a couple of examples are shown here in the figure. So on the left, there is a, um, the spectra for uh, zero plus multipolar and on the right side, uh, uh, for just for example, the two plus spectra and the Neutron is double beta decay matrix elements, or the absolute value of it is shown on the positive y axis and the muon capture matrix elements, or again, the uh, absolute value of it is shown on the negative, uh, negative y axis. And the energy here is the excitation energy of the intermediate nucleus of double beta decay, which is the um, actually the final nucleus for muon capture. So, yeah, as these figures show you, uh, in some cases, like for the two plus multiple, the agreement between the matrix elements is pretty good. But on the other cases, uh, I don't know, there is uh, and there are less similarities in these two spectra. But these, since the Q values of these two processes are similar of the order of 100 MeV, as I said before, 
the states with same energy are supposed to be important for both decays. And there are also experiments, I mean, muon capture experiments under planning for these nuclei, at least at uh, RCMP Osaka and uh, at uh, PSI in Switzerland. And comparing the future measurements against our theory estimates could shed light on the neutronist double beta decay. But that remains to be seen, as we don't yet have the experimental data. So to summarize the muon capture part, by studying uh, ordinary muon capture, we could shed light on the unknown effective values of GA on the momentum exchange region uh, that is relevant for uh, neutronized double beta decay, which was 100 MeV. And that's what, that's what we did. I mean, we compared our total capture rates with the Primakov estimates, and we uh, got a strong quench uh, GA based on those studies. Uh, on the other hand, in order to probe the effective value of GP, uh, I didn't talk too much about this, but for this, we would need to have data on capture rates to individual states, since GP doesn't affect the total capture rates as much as, uh, as, much as uh, GA. And there are also experiments under planning to uh, measure the capture rights to individual states, but there is not too much experimental data available yet. So this remains to be seen too. Um, and yes, our computations manage to re reproduce the observed location of ordinary muon capture science resonance, which was measured at first time um, for 100 niobium at RCMP. Uh, but however, comparing the obtained capture rate with the Primakov estimate uh, suggested a strongly quenched GA. And furthermore, there are similarities between the energy multiple decompositions of neutronized double beta decay and ordinary muon capture matrix elements. Okay, so then I will move on to what uh, have I uh, done after my uh, defense in October. So, so far in the calculations that I have presented here, we have estimated the bound uh, muon wave function, I mean the wave function of the muon when it's bound on the atomic orbits of the uh, nucleus uh, by a beta salvator point-like nucleus approximation, which is shown here in the figure uh, uh, in black. It's not really visible, but if you uh, look at the small r values, you may uh, see it here. Uh, but we could also solve the uh, bound, muon wave, bound muon wave function exactly from the Dirac equation, keeping in mind the finite size of the nucleus. Uh, okay. I won't call it that yet, but that was what we did. So, uh, Jenny Kotila, who is also from Jyväskylä, she computed the muon capture, uh, I mean the bound muon wave functions in, uh, for example, in 106 cadmium. And the red curve here uh, corresponds to the exact muon wave function when she assume that the, the nucleus is point-like, like our approximation before. And you can see that it's really close to the approximative value. 
and then she took into account the <clears throat> the finite size of the nucleus, which is shown here in blue. So there is quite a big difference at low R values, like less than uh, 10 femtometers. So you could think that this affects the matrix elements, actually, uh, a lot. So that was what we did. We studied the effect of these wave functions on uh, muon capture matrix elements. And also we studied if there would be a relation between um, neutrinos double beta plus and muon capture matrix elements. So previously on my slides, when I said uh, neutralized double beta decay, I was talking about the beta minus beta minus decay. But here we studied the beta plus beta plus decays and muon capture on the, not on the daughter nucleus, but on the mother nucleus of these decays. But yes, these results are not published yet, but they should be published in Frontiers in Physics soon, I hope. And another project that I've been working on is muon capture on light nuclei from first principles. So we have studied the muon capture uh, on these light SD or FP shell nuclei using the VS IES G. Wait, <laughs> I may have mixed it again, but anyway, from, with the ab initio method in collaboration with uh, the Triumph Theory group. And we aim to compare the results with my uh, shell model calculations, which I show here uh, in case of uh, 32 uh, uh, system for a couple of different um, interactions. And there are also experiments under planning to measure these capture rates. So in the future, we hope that we could uh, show or shed light on the GA quenching by studying muon capture from first principles and by comparing it with, uh, on the other hand, with shell model and uh, in the future uh, with the experimental results. Okay, and then uh, some future directions. As you can see, now we moved from Finland to uh, actually to Spain. It's a bit more sunny. No, no so much, uh, not so much snow anymore. So what I'm going to study here is basically neutron nuclear scattering, which is an other weak interaction process which serves as a probe of beyond standard model interactions. So as such, it is allowed by the standard model, but there is also a possibility of beyond standard model contributions. And precise theoretical estimates could help extract the beyond standard model physics from the data of future experiments. And here you can see a figure of coherent uh, elastic neutron nuclear scattering. And what are we planning to do exactly? So we plan to make comparisons between the cross sections obtained using different nuclear structure methods, the shell model, uh, BNQ RPA, and also the VS IMS RG method in order to provide as accurate predictions as possible. And in a recent work, which is shown here, uh, the elastic uh, neutron nucleus scattering was studied in large case, a large scale uh, shell model approach. So we aim to extend these studies to inelastic scattering, um, including high energies 
beyond uh, the shell model reach with the help of uh, PN core PA, which can reach the higher excitation energies. And eventually, we aim to uh, improve the theoretical treatment of the cross sections uh, by using the first principles method that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so that was all from my side. So I'm happy to receive any kind of questions or comments. Thank you very much, Lotta, for a very nice. Uh interesting talk and also very perfectly timed so that's great are there any questions if not maybe i can start i'll have some of my some of my own um I, and i guess my questions are basically you know from my ignorance on the pn qrpa method so you were talking about this uh the, this um constants, the GPH, GPP, which multiply some matrix element. And I was uh, mm -hmm. from presumably some residual interaction, right? And yes. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about, you know, where these matrix elements come from and, and how they sort of, I guess, match with the, with Saxon potential that you're using. Right? Uh -huh. Okay, so where is my slide? Here. So the GPH uh, multiplies this kind of matrix elements and GPP multiplies the particle par particle particle matrix elements. So meaning that here instead of whole, we have uh, the particle. So there's, they are the renormalization factors. And our method, as I said, is based on the wood Jackson potential. So first we I mean, compute the single particle basis for neutrons and protons using the wood saxon uh, potential. And then we make the BCS um, calculations, and hence we uh, obtain the uh, quasi-particles and quasi-pairs. And then we make a PNQRPA diagonalization of the matrix. And then uh, finally, we obtain the uh, excitations in the odd nuclei. And so, uh, I don't know, uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it was, that was much clearer. Uh, and those matrix elements come from, um, I get so this PN, V, V prime, N prime, um, mm -hmm. You need to couple these states somehow. So I guess what I'm wondering is where do these elements come from? Ah, okay. So the two-body uh, interaction we are using is based on the bon, bon uh, D potential. I hope I didn't mix the uh, alphabet again. Uh, bon D, well, I would say. Um, okay, yeah, that's, al that's already something. Yeah, the bon potential. Yes. Good. Um, so you showed that you had obtained this GPH um, by comparing both, you know, either to the gamma of Teller or, mm -hmm. or to the isovector dipole here. I was wondering, is there a tension between the, the two values? I mean, you, you showed the response and the response is very similar, but I was wondering whether the two values actually agreed or are they very far away for um, the contents that, themselves? Yeah, that depends on the nucleus, but um, for most cases, I mean, I have those published in the paper, but I can't remember those by half, but in most cases, those two values were not too far away. From each other, right. That's what I wanted to know whether there was a big, uh, you know, difference or, or not. No, Alfredo? mostly not. Alfredo, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted just to, but you are come. Probably you are in the in the right place to uh, to uh, become conversant with that rapidly, but there is all this work of Tomas, Rodriguez, and, uh, and uh, Javier and others that uh, shows that uh, for the neutrino less double beta decay, uh, and, uh, rather mysteriously, the treatment of the isoscalar pairing is fundamental. 
probably related to the restoration of SU4 symmetry. Uh, in, uh, and this is one thing that is completely absent. Well, it, this is one of the many things that are completely absent in the, in the quasi-particle RPA. Mm -hmm. So this may affect seriously everything. Yes. Yeah, that's true. It might be, I mean, the 3A quenching might be partly, at least partly explained by, by that. And also some other, uh, I mean, missing pieces in our model. Yeah, but good luck with the new, new avenue. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, maybe I How? can ask something. Mm -hmm. Or someone else was. No, you go yeah. ahead, Javier, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so, so I have a question regarding the, the muon capture to individual states in yes. with the medium SRG that you have planned. OK, yes. So one of your okay. goals you mentioned is to um, learn about the, the so-called quenching mm -hmm. at finite momentum transfer. Mm -hmm. But these uh, calculations you have done so far, uh, do they include the momentum transfer uh, to body currents as well? Because they might be relevant there. Yes, that is true. Our calculations don't. <laughs> contain those currents and yes it's true we might have to take those into account so the plan is to do this in the near future i i, I guess yes i hope so <laughs> yeah but it's i know it's complicated yeah yeah okay yeah no uh, yeah thanks so so probably yeah if you can compare theory to experiment in principle if you are sure that this is the only ingredient missing in your theory you could blame it for the disagreement, but I think at the moment it would be a little bit risky. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think, it, yeah, not having this uh, final momentum currents uh, might might might, might uh, confuse a little bit the comparison. Yes, that's but, true. But yeah, I, I, that that was uh, my question: whether you had it or, or not. But is there another question? Or now? Yep. Em sents o puc parlar o...? Sí, sí, Xavier, digues, digues. Go ahead. Vale, okay. No, no. Okay, I have a question uh, relatively related with the first question of our now. The mm. question is how much depends your result on the boot saxon that you choose? Because there are many or several at least available in the market from where your boot saxon for the basis comes from? Um, wait, the, uh, sorry, I'm <laughs> terrible with the names, but uh, the parameterization comes from uh, the uh, bohr Mottelson uh, models. So yeah, probably, I mean, I have <laughs> mentioned that in my, in my papers, but that's where it's based on. And also, if you are familiar with my supervisor, Rioni Suhonen's book, you can find the, the wood Jackson potential that we are using from the book. So. No, because there are many, or at least there are several, yes. some of them even based on, on reactions and things like that, phenomenological. Mm -hmm. Uh, boot saxon potentials. If you use another boot saxon potential, the results will change very much or only a little, or this is irrelevant. Can um, you have a feeling about this? Uh, I haven't studied that actually, so I don't really know. Yeah, I should, I mean, I should try some other potential to be able to answer this. 
No, no, okay, don't worry. Eh? It was only a question. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, yes, yes. Nothing else. Eh? <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, there have been many questions. I think this was a very lively talk. Thank you very much, Lota. Um, I guess we should. Uh, are there any other urgent questions? Uh, otherwise, we will just leave it there. Thank you a lot again for a, a very nice talk. Uh, good luck with your settling down in Barcelona and hopefully mm -hmm. um, see you soon. Yeah. All right. See Thank you, you soon. Much. Thanks. Cheers.